the message that I have for you guys today is a message. I, so I actually, along with being the executive campus pastor, I have the honor and privilege of being the young adult and college pastor as well. Uh, and we just got out of a series called He Understands. And it's an amazing series. Um, but the whole heart behind it was I believe that the Lord has given me uh, my life mission. Not that uh, he's not going to call me to do some other things. Um, but what I feel that the Lord has laid on my heart, that in this lifetime, what the Lord has given me to do uh, is to break down the walls of religion and to show people what relationship with Jesus looks like. I think that religion is a lot of rules and expectations. And if you don't look like this, act like this, talk like this, don't come near us. And the fact is, is I think somewhere down the line, the church forgot how to be the church. And whenever people showed up and they had a little bit of a past, and they had a little bit of history, it was easier to look at them and judge them rather than saying, hey, you're welcome. But everyone wants to be called. Everyone wants to be the church. So why is it that we want to be the church? We want to have the call, but we can't even be the church in church. I'm just being real. I'm just being honest. And if you don't like it, you can email me at Pastor Cameron at 8. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, hey, I, I get to go home today. So some of you guys might, oh, daggum, that boy, he, he's mean, something like that. Like, ah, I get to go home to love it. Pastor Cameron got to deal with it. But that's the, that's the truth. That's, that's a fact, is that somewhere down the line, it's like we forgot that we had a past. And I think some of that has to deal with the fact because we've made our relationship with Jesus so religious that it's almost as if we believe that we've got to live up to this expectation for him to even love us, which is where this whole entire series that I got out of, uh, it, it explains that Jesus understands what we're going through. I think sometimes... And catch me, I'm, I'm going to break this down, I promise for you, so stay with me when I say this. But I think sometimes we focus so much on the God side of God that we forgot that he was also human. That we forget that he truly understands what we went through. And it's easier to push him away in that sense because it's like, ah, you don't understand, this doesn't make sense. But if you would, go ahead and if you have your, your physical Bibles, open them up. If not, you got your phone or I'm sure they're going to throw the scripture up there. But Hebrews 12, 2 through 3 says, we must never stop looking to Jesus. He is the leader of our faith, and he is the one who makes our faith complete. He suffered death on a cross, but he accepted the shame of the cross as if it were nothing. Someone say nothing. Because of the joy he could see waiting for him, and now he is sitting at the right side of God's throne. Think about Jesus. He patiently endured the angry insults that sinful people were shouting at him. Think about him so that you won't get discouraged and stop trying. Now, again, I want to read this one part again. It says, he accepted the shame of the cross as if it were nothing. Because of the joy he could see awaiting him. Someone say joy. How many of you in here know that that joy that the Bible's talking about is me and you? And if we're being real, we're a bad bet. God's not a bad bet. We can bet on God any day of the week and know that he's going to show up. He's going to show out. He's going to do exactly what he said. But how many people in here know that whenever we make promises or say that we're going to do something, sometimes we don't follow through with it. And the reality of it is, is we are a bad bet. And it left me sitting here wondering, how many people in here, if you're just being real and honest, why did God send his one and only son for me? Why did he do that? Because I do this, I did this, and I did this. I don't deserve this love. This doesn't make sense. Why did he do it? And he took it as if it were nothing. And that verse right there means the world to me. Because it's me and you. We're the imperfect bride of Christ, and he's waiting on us. And that's good news for me and you, because then I read this right here in John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, someone say whoever, believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him now how many people in here know that it's good news to be a whoever that it's not just one specific person that it's not just the most holy person that it's not just the most perfect person or just this person over here just this person over here no 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 no. he came for the whoever believes in him so if you can just get to a spot of saying you know what I believe you don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have this, 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 and your ducks all in a row. Can I, can I tell you that it is okay to struggle? 
And I'm fixing to say something that some of you are going to look at me like I'm crazy, but sin is not what sends you to hell. Sin is inevitable. You are going to sin every single day, whether it's something big or whether it's something small, whether you stub your foot on the couch and you're like, ooh, mm, no one in here, just me. Hey, if I'm being real. Or, hey, listen, maybe, maybe it's them kids. Maybe that's why you sent them to kids' church today because this morning you're like, kick them down the stairs and everything. Maybe that's just us Texas people, but there's some of them. I was telling someone earlier, hey, listen, you're anointed for this position. Like, God has not called me to a place of kids' ministry, and I love going back to the back and seeing everyone and giving the high fives and, hey, it's so good to see you. But the moment they start crying, I'm like, ah. But that's the thing. We, we mess up. We sin every day, whether it's small or it's big. We mess up every day. So this message came from a thought that the Lord had spoke to me uh, about a month or two ago about rejection. And it really caused me to sit there and think about the, the, the relational side of God, the human side of God, thinking about how he wants relationship with us, not religion with us. And thinking about it now, it makes me wonder if though we hear how much of a relationship that the Lord wants with us, have we based our relationship with God on, on good works? That if I can just hold open this door more and more and more, and if I can just sit there and say, hey, welcome to church, that, that God is going to love me. If I can just show someone to their parking spot, and maybe it's even outside of church, but if I can tell someone they look really, really good, and here's the thing, sometimes, how many times do you tell someone they look really, really good, but their hair's all ratchet, and it's a little bit over here, and you're like, hey, you look so good, and it's like, you a lie. You lying right now. Come on, be honest with that person. But the thing is, is, is We've based this relationship with God on good works. And if we're being real this morning, that, that's stressful. That if I don't do enough good works in the day, that if I don't get enough of my, my checklist checked off, then God doesn't love me, God doesn't want me. He, 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 I messed up and I'm automatically and I'm going to hell. And the reality of it is, is at some point, we have all faced that conversation looking in the mirror. Does God actually love me because I messed up today or I just had a bad day? And religion tells me that God forbid you have one bad day. But relationship with the Lord says, no, 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 no. Listen, I know that you had a bad day. Religion says go and hide from God. Relationship says come to God. It says come to the Father. I, I saw this post the other day. And, and basically what it said was when you mess up, the instant thing is, oh, I can't tell daddy. I got to run away. But relationship with your dad says that whenever all hell breaks loose, whenever you mess up, whenever you do something that you thought that you should have never done, or you got in a situation that you shouldn't be in, it shouldn't be let me go run and let me go hide. Let me, let me just box up. Let me just isolate. It should be where are you, God? I need you right now. God, I need you. I need you to show up. God, I need you to do this. But I think, again, religion has got us in this spot that it's isolated us. And the reality of it is, is the church is a body of people. This, this building right here, let me, let me tell you, you guys have an amazing facility. You guys are blessed with one of the most amazing facilities. I think that this facility is great, and what you guys have been doing with it is absolutely amazing, but it's not a church. The fact that we come and we think that, hey, we're going to go to church, and we're going to attend a daycare. Here's the thing, at the end of the day, your pastor's job is not to be your best friend first. Your pastor's job is to be your pastor. And I think sometimes we go to church and we get offended with the pastor before we ever go take it to God and ask him what he thought that he had to say about it. So the reality of it is, is we don't have an issue with getting offended with people, but when someone gets offended with us, oh, God forbid that happens. But then you hold people to other standards that you're not even willing to meet yourself. So again, let me, let me challenge you this morning to stop looking at this so much as a daycare and start looking at it as an equipping center. This is, this, this is what this building is, is an equipping center for the body of Christ. Here's the thing, if the unchurched people wanted to be in church, they would already be here. 
Majority of the people in here this morning, you have probably been attending church for at least six months, maybe three months, but you've been, you've been attending church for a little bit. You already know what to expect. And the reality of it is, is this is an equipping center so that you can go get the unchurched in here. And it's not through religion, it's through relationship. If I can't build the trust with you first, how do you ever expect me to be able to speak into your life? I think one of the worst things that you can do is when someone is going through it and the first thing that you go over to them is try to shove Jesus down their throat. That it's like, hey, let me, let me think about how many scriptures that I can quote right now for you. And the reality of it is, is it's not that they need more scriptures, it's that they need the presence. Because if scripture was enough, See, everyone would be getting to heaven. Because I think a lot of times we know scripture, but we don't know scripture. So again, it's not about religion. It's about the relationship. And sometimes the greatest message that you can preach is not one with your words, but it's one with your actions. This past week, we, we, uh, we had a person in our church pass away. And um, our guest experience pastor, uh, she called me and she said, Pastor Hunter, I don't know what to do. I've never been in a situation like this. How do I pastor them? I don't know what to say. And I said, hold up, hold up, hold up. You don't have to say anything. It's just a simple act of you showing up and you just being there and then submitting your tongue to the Lord and allowing the Lord to speak through you as he may. I think sometimes we get stuck in this spot feeling that we have to have it all figured out, that we have to have it all together. God doesn't need you to have it all together. He just needs your yes. God can do more with your yes than he can your nothing, and he can for sure do more with your yes than he can your complaining. So again, in other words, is, is it, have we got to this place that we only get to heaven based on good things that we can do? And the reality of that is that's a tiring place to be in. The anxiety alone from messing up, even in the tiniest way, is so exhausting. And then to add to that, the stress of the day or even the heartbreak of the day, it's exhausting. But what if I told you that there's an easier way to be in relationship with Jesus? And out of this, good works will flow naturally because it's not forced. You know, I used to think I'm 23 years old. I turn 24 next month. Uh, or I'm sorry, I turn 24 in August. I'm getting my days all confused. I'm not even at that age yet, guys. I am at that age. Let me be straight up with you. Some of y'all look like he, he's young, but I am an old soul. I go to bed early. I wait a couple weeks, or yeah, a couple weeks ago on Memorial Day. I got up about 6.30, I got some ribs out, I started getting the ribs ready, turned the smoker on, got my coffee ready, and then I took my dog outside, put the ribs on the smoker, and I sat on the back porch, just looking out, enjoying the smoker, about 7 in the morning when all the other kids my age are, <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm just like, hey, come on somebody. But good works will flow naturally out of being in relationship with the Lord. I'm 23 years old. I've been raised in the church my whole entire life, and it wasn't until a couple years ago that I knew the true grace and mercy of God, that my whole relationship with the Lord was built on religion, not that my parents had ever forced that on me. In fact, they told me, hey, if you can go get a job doing anything else, go do something else. Because it wasn't until I got into ministry that you find out not everyone's going to love you the way that you love them. So I'm sitting there, and I have this religious mindset. And it was in 2021, I had a massive blow up. Massive blow up. Led me to take three months away from ministry to go and get my head straight. I went and we, we own a t-shirt shop. Uh, we own a screen printing shop. Uh, and so I go over there and I start working there for three months. And my attitude at first was horrible. I'm like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. I'm done doing this. This doesn't make sense. I'm done with ministry. I don't like this. And then I start telling everyone about the t-shirt shop. And I had some people the other day because it's part of my testimony. And someone came up to say, hey, what, what's the t-shirt shop? I said, it's, it's a t-shirt shop. They said, is that like where bad people go? I'm like, well, I mean, in this case. <laughs> but the thing is, is whenever I went away for three months, that's whenever I got to experience the mercy and the grace of God. It went from head knowledge to heart knowledge. Because it's real easy to get up here and preach about grace and mercy, but until you actually go through something and you see what God's going to do with that grace and mercy, that's something different. 
Took three months away, came back, uh, preached my first message in October of 2022, launched the Young Adults Ministry in January, and then it has been blowing up and growing ever since then. But I think that it got to a spot that it wasn't focused so much on religion. It was focused on reaching the unchurched and being in relationship. One more story, and then i got to get back to this because this is funny. Out of doing that and wanting to reach the unchurched and being in relationship, the reality of it is, is again, if people wanted to be in church, they would already be in church because they already know what to expect. We're really, really famous for hosting the most churched events in the world and expecting the unchurched people to come. Am I right? I'm just being honest with you. So what I did, and for all of you people here, uh, you cannot tell me that you don't know what this date means. And if you say that you don't, then I'm going to say you need to be in the altar afterwards and we're going to pray. But it was on 420. Anyone in here know what 420 is? It's just April 20th. I don't know why everyone's laughing. Someone say it's your birthday? Oh, I bet you had a good birthday. <laughs> High on the Holy Spirit, amen. But it was on 420, and I told my team, I gathered them up, and I said, hey, I'm going to push the boundaries a little bit. Sometimes the church may look at us and say, hey, that's not right, but my heart is not to please the church. It's to get the unchurched person into the church. And so what we ended up doing was I went, and I got all of these brownies, y'all. Like, I went to the, the cakery in Lubbock, and I told them, and I said, hey, I need this many brownies for 420. And they said, well, we don't do those kind of brownies. I said, I'm not asking for those kind of brownies. But shh, you don't have to tell people that. So then we had Soda Shack, and we had them come out and everything. And, and some people may look at me like I'm crazy for what I did, and you may judge me for what I did, and that's okay because the result at the end of this story was completely worth it. But I ended up, we had uh, a little over 115 people show up that night, and God's been doing some amazing things. But then I have five people show up that are completely high out of their mind. And they're like, hey, we heard there's brownies here. And I'm like, there is and they're like, okay, where is it? I said, I'll show you. It's over here. And one of them got mad. He said, bro, this ain't real brownies. He said, I'm out of here. The other four stayed for service, and they were in the altar giving their life to the Lord afterwards. That's what relationship with the Lord looks like. It means that I'm going to meet you where you are at and through building trust, we will get the rest of the way. The Lord is not interested in your resume. He's interested in your yes. So let me ask you, when was the last time you stopped giving people in the Lord your resume and just told the Lord yes to whatever he may ask? Because God might use you in so many ways that you didn't believe God could use you. The other day, I, I was talking to our, our AVL guy, and, and shout out to the media team. You guys are amazing, um, but if you guys ever get up on stage and need to preach and there's something that goes wrong, they're always the safe bet to blame. Just telling you. Love you guys. Thank you all so much. Don't mute me, please. But I was talking to our AVL guy, and, and the, we were talking about this message, and, and he brought up the idea that sometimes I think in a good, healthy relationship, if you were going to call someone that you haven't talked to in a minute, for instance, if you send a kid to college or it's a family member that doesn't live here and you call them, the first thing that you're probably not going to say is, hey, how many good works did you do today? Hey, did you do this? Hey, did you do that? Oh my gosh, if you didn't do that, have you been to church in the last couple of weeks? Because if not, you're going to hell. That's not how a conversation should work. The, conversa the conversation should be as simple as saying, hey, how are you? Tell me, what, how, how's your family? Tell me what's going on. How's your heart? Is there any way that I can pray for you? What, you want to go out to lunch? And that's how the Lord is with us, is he wants the conversation. But somewhere down the line, I think that we made it super religious, and we tried to make it more King James Version and say, oh, holier than thou. God bless me with your many blessings. Rain down on me. Open the floodgates of heaven. And the Lord's probably sitting up there like, who's talking to me? Because I didn't create you to be that way. You don't even recognize you when you're talking like that. Sometimes the conversation may look as simple as, God, hey, I just need some help today. It's just a simple relationship. You see, this is the type of the relationship that God 
wants with us. And it's after checking on your heart. Here's the thing. Being in relationship with the Lord doesn't mean that you get a free pass. It does mean that, hey, you get to mess up, but the Lord's going to hold you to a higher standard. Everyone wants a pastor. Everyone wants a coach. Everyone wants a mentor until it's time to be pastored, until it's time to be coached, and until it's time to be mentored. Everyone wants a pastor. I would love a pastor. And everyone, listen, if you know my mom, my mom, she, she's a powerhouse, but she is not the person you want coaching you. Someone came, I would love Pastor Trish to pastor me and coach me and mentor me. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't know what you're asking for. And the Lord, in the same way, he's going to bring correction, but not out of hate, but out of love. And I think sometimes we get it confused that if the Lord corrects me, it's because he has it out to get me. Or if the pastor corrects me, then it's because he has it out to get me. Why is it that the pastor has it out to get you versus he just loves you? That he sees something on the inside of you that maybe you're not able to see. See, the Lord wants to correct because that's how important you are. He wants to give you the tools to get back on track so that one day we can spend eternity with him. Can I tell you that getting to heaven is not the ultimate goal? Being in relationship with the Lord is the ultimate goal, and going to heaven is a reward of being in relationship with him. I think sometimes we idolize heaven so much that we're forced and we're scared into a relationship with the Lord when the reality of it is, is not that you should be scared into a relationship with the Lord, it's that you should be invited into a relationship with the Lord. I, I, I want to apologize on the behalf of all churches who may have preached the gospel in a way that was scaring you so that you don't go to hell, but can I tell you, if you're in relationship with the Lord, again, sin does not send you to hell, it's the intent of your heart. So if you mess up, if you're struggling, there's a difference between just asking for forgiveness versus repenting. Asking for forgiveness means that you know exactly what you're going to go back and do. But repenting says, you know what, I messed up, I'm turning away from my past, and I'm stepping forward into what God has ultimately called me to do. That's the difference. And sometimes I think we'll take advantage of God's grace and mercy to use it as a crutch. And so that one day whenever we get back up, well, he's going to forgive me no matter what. And yes, he loves you. He's going to forgive you. But again, what is the intent of your heart? That's what God's looking at. But if we can be honest in here this morning, how many of us feel that, that Hunter, I, I hear you. God loves me. He wants relationship with me. But I just don't feel that way. That it feels like every time I go to church and I leave church, I, I leave with an encouraging message and I hear and the worship's great and all of that and it's amazing. But every time I leave, it seems like the enemy's always out to get me. That no matter what I do, no matter how many times I read my Bible, no matter how many times I go to church, no matter how many times I pray, it doesn't matter because everything around me is just falling apart. My marriage is falling apart. My friendships are falling apart. My car is falling apart. My house is falling apart. My kids don't want to come home anymore. I don't have kids. I don't have this. I don't have that. And it doesn't make any sense. So, Hunter, I hear you. But if I'm being honest with you, it doesn't just feel like people in the world are rejecting me. It feels like God's rejecting me. And if, we're, if I'm going to be totally honest with you, during my three months, that's how I felt. And I didn't once look at what I did. I just sat here and I pointed a finger at God and said, you took this away from me. And had I continued to walk the path that I was going, it was maybe months away from me never being in ministry again. And the enemy, you got two ways to look at what I'm fixing to say. The enemy gave an opportunity for me to run. I had a job offer from Gateway Houston to go and be a pastor over there, to be the guest experience pastor. That's what I started off doing in the church. I knew how to do guest experience. But the thing was, was I had an opportunity to either stand firm where I was and get healing or go somewhere else and bleed all over people who don't deserve it. 
So the answer isn't to run. The answer is to stand firm where God has you planted and get the healing so that you can get back out there and do what God has called you to do. Can I tell you that the pain that you're experiencing is not God's will for your life? And a lot of times we'll sit here and say that the enemy sent it to destroy me. But my question to you, is it that God sent it to refine you? Was it that the enemy sent it to destroy you or God sent it to refine you? The reality of it is, is both ways God can use it because God takes what the enemy meant for evil and he uses it for his good. But the thing is, is everyone wants to get restored, but no one wants to be obedient to the process. Being in relationship with the Lord means that there is going to be a process put in place that it might be a little bit different than how you expected. But the thing is, is God knows better than I know. So I've got to trust his heart for me. Sometimes it looks like, you know what, no matter what I do for the Lord, there's always an argument, there's always an obstacle, there's always rejection, there's always insults. But maybe some of the rejection that we're experiencing isn't from other people, it's from yourself. That I'm not good enough. That I've messed up, there's no way God could love me. There's no way that God could want me. And can I tell you, as a pastor's kid, that was my thought. My spiritual mom, Amanda Hill, she called me. And if you know Amanda Hill, she's absolutely amazing. She lives in South Carolina, but she's a powerhouse too. And and Amanda Hill, she calls me and she says, hey, talk to me. What happened? I said, I messed up. She said, you sure did. Like, well, tell me something I don't know. And she said, you blew it. She said, but it's going to be okay. And if it wasn't for that woman calling me and saying, hey, everything's going to be okay, she bought a plane ticket the next day and she flew down to Texas to come and lead me through some counseling for me to experience the grace and the mercy that God has. And if it wasn't for that, then I'm not on this stage today. The thing is, is if you don't get your healing, it doesn't just affect you. It affects the thousands of people who could have been impacted by your yes had you given it to God. Your healing is worth more than just you. But again, sometimes it's our own mindsets of rejection or even just disqualifying ourselves. Can I tell you? That whether you believe it or not, Jesus actually understands where you're coming from. You see, when Jesus came down from heaven, he was fully human and fully God. And after sitting in a time of prayer with him, I've come to realize that the human side of Jesus truly and fully understood what I'm walking through. It was about a month ago, and I got in my truck, and I'm driving around the loop. And I'm so mad, and I'm so angry, and I don't understand, and I asked God, I said, God, this is not at all what I thought was going to happen. I had this promise, and it feels like everything's just falling apart. Am I not good enough to come into this promise? Am I not good enough to, to see the fruition of this promise? Why in the world did you do this? This doesn't make any sense at all. I said, I'm so mad at you. And I'm going around the loop in Lubbock, and that makes it worse because there's horrible drivers in Lubbock. Except for me. Listen, I wear the crown on my head of being the world's best driver. I'm just telling you right now. Some of you guys say, oh, my gosh, that kid's full of it. But here's the thing. Here's why. I bought a prophet. You guys know the prophets in the Bible? Tells you of the things to come. Yeah, my prophet's name is Escort Radar, and it tells me of the people with the red and blue lights to come. I got one ticket, y'all, and never again. I'm telling y'all right now, y'all say that's illegal. I say that's an answered prayer. But I'm mad and I'm angry and I'm driving round and round and round and round on the loop and it doesn't make any sense to me. And all I heard the Lord say was, I'm just glad you're here. And I think sometimes we think that God can't take our complaining, that God can't take our anger. And the reality of it is, is he's a big enough God that he can take your anger. The thing is, is it's not that you're angry at God. It's that whenever you're angry, you decide not to take it to God at all. We expect other people to give us an explanation as to why they're upset, as to why they're mad. But we never give God an opportunity. First off, he doesn't have to explain himself. 
Because if I, I can't go based off of what I feel because how I feel in the moment is going to lie to me. So I can't go based off of my feelings. I have to go based off of what I know. And what I know was that in the past before, when I took three months away and I thought all hell was breaking loose, that if God did it before, he's going to do it again. So again, I cannot go based off of how I feel. I have to go based off of what I know. And what I know is that God is a good God. He's going to provide. And even whenever the circumstances of my life change, it does not dictate his DNA and it doesn't dictate what he's going to do. That's the kind of God that we serve. So I sat there in my truck and I'm frustrated and I just word vomited to the Lord. And so clearly I felt the Lord share with my heart that Jesus walked this earth and battled our rejection and criticism just so that he could give us not only the greatest gift of all, which is grace and salvation, but so that he could also get the sense of hope of getting to celebrate our journey to get to him one day. Some of you might be wondering, well, Hunter, what what do you mean hope? Here's the thing. I'm, I'm battling for a promise right now. I have this promise from the Lord. And that promise is worth my absolute everything. But I'm sitting here and I'm battling promise, or I'm battling for this promise, and I'm experiencing this feeling, and I'm experiencing this feeling. I got this person over here and this thing, and it's like trial after trial after trial. Jesus went through the same thing, not with the guarantee of a promise. See, here's the thing. I got a guaranteed promise from the Lord. But Jesus, he didn't have this guaranteed promise. He had this hope. And in my head, I can't prove this biblically, but in my head, this is how the conversation that the Lord had with Jesus went. I truly believe it went something like this. He said, Jesus, hey, I I have this plan. I have this idea that all of our creation, that we are going to get to spend eternity with them, that they're going to be able to to come to heaven, and we're going to have this big feast. We're going to have chicken. We're going to have steak. We're going to have bluebell ice cream. Bless God. Amen. Come on, somebody. Let me tell you right now, I am pumpkin pie. Listen, I am the world's basic white girl, y'all. Pumpkin spice lattes, white mochas, peppermint mochas, peppermint white mochas. Woo! You know, like whenever you get into bed and you wake up in the morning, it feels real good and you get that, that stretch, but it's kind of like, oh, and that stretch feels amazing. Whenever I get that pumpkin spice latte, I'm like, so there's going to be pumpkin spice lattes in heaven. Let me tell y'all, y'all say no. I say yes. He says, hey, the desires of your heart will be here. Amen. But Jesus, we're, we're going to have this feast and we're going to get to celebrate. We're going to get to celebrate all of our creation. We're going to get to spend eternity with them and it's going to be absolutely amazing, but Jesus, what I need you to know is that I can't, I can't promise that this is going to happen. Son, this is, a, this is only a hope. I need you to, to go down to earth, and I need you to, to actually go and accept criticism. I need you to accept the rejection. I need you to accept the pain. I need you to accept that people are going to walk away from you. You're even going to have one of your followers betray you. You're going to have one of your followers deny you. But Jesus, can I tell you right now that even if it's just one person, it's worth it. That we'll have this whole feast, just, just the four of us. We'll have this whole entire feast, and it's going to be great, but... Jesus, right now, it's just a vision. It's just this plan that I have. I have this hope and I have this vision. And here I am, battling for this promise from the Lord. Yet Jesus looked at me in the middle of all the mess that I am and said, you know what? He's the one that I'm sending you for. You're the one that Jesus came for. You're the one that Jesus came for. You are the one that Jesus came for. All on the hope that you would even want to be in relationship with him. And the Lord is saying, I can't guarantee it. But even if one, can I tell you, it's completely worth it. Completely worth it. Jesus walked through rejection and pain just in the hopes of seeing his vision come to full fruition one day. See, he wasn't promised us. And here's the thing. He walked through all of this suffering just to see his vision come to fruition. And if that's not love, then I don't know what is. That's the true love of God. Jesus 
before he went to the cross, went to a time of prayer. And what I love about this scripture is it describes to us right before he prays what he was going through. Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and he bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Now, the reality of it is, can you take it back one scripture? Right there. The reality of it is, is whenever we read this, us as humans, we read this and we say, yeah, I want your will to be done, not mine. My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. And we as humans, we read that. But if he is fully human, and he is fully God. And right before that, it tells me that he was anguished and distressed and that his soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. I guarantee you that that didn't happen the way that the Bible records. It records it in a way for us to read it, but to be a human and know what anxiety looks like, it probably didn't look like that. In fact, in my head, I have to sit there and think he's on his knees and he's heartbroken. And there's anxiety. He says, Lord, God, if there's any other way, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to do this. This doesn't make sense to me. You're asking me to come down here. You're asking me to take this rejection. You're asking me to take this pain. And then not only that, but the ones that was in your vision, the ones that you sent me here for are going to be the very ones that sit here and they beat me and they're going to drive nails through my hands and they're not going to want me. And then the ones that are following me, one of them's going to betray me. The other one's going to deny me. So Lord, if there's any other way, I don't want to take this pain. I don't want to take this hurt. It doesn't make sense. My heart is broken. I'm tired of the emotional pain. I'm tired of the stress. I'm tired of the anxiety. I'm tired of the depression. I'm tired of not feeling wanted. Why did you send me here for this? This doesn't make any sense. And then I have to believe that the God side came back into play and he says, but not my will, but your will be done. And thank God, that his will was done. Because without him going to the cross, none of this matters. None of this is worth anything. We continue and he says, then he returned to the disciples and he found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me just one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time saying the same things again. Have your rest. Have your rest. Go ahead, sleep, have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. To me in the scripture, and again, I can't prove this biblically. This is just something between me and the Lord that I've been praying. But that Jesus knew something. He knew that Peter would deny him. But the human side of Jesus, you think about this, the human side of Jesus went over to Peter. He says, hey, just wake up. You need to pray because temptation is near. You need to strengthen your spirit, which causes me to question, did Peter really have to go and deny him? Or was that the story we got told because Peter didn't get up and pray? God, Jesus still took it. God still took it. He takes what the enemy meant for evil and he uses it for good. But Peter, just wake up. 
You just need to pray. Temptation is on the way. I don't want you to fall. I don't want you to have to experience the, 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 the pain of this because I know that there's going to be heartbreak. You're going to feel like a complete failure. So if you would just get up, and the thing is, is he's not just asking for him to pray. Really, all he's saying is, would you just come stay near to me? Would you just sit next to me? Would you just be in relationship with me? And the thing is, is how many of us right now that the Lord is sitting here saying, you need to spiritually wake up. You are asleep. You've been riding the bench. You've been doing this. You've been doing that. You've been teeter-tottering between whether or not you are going to go to church. You've been teeter-tottering between whether or not you're going to be in a relationship with me. But you just need to wake up. You need to wake up. You need to remember who you are. You need to remember that you have a calling on your life, that you have destiny on your life, that there's a God that loves you. You need to remember. You need to get up. But the thing is, is we sit here and we complain so much. Oh, my gosh, it's so early. Or, oh, my gosh, it's so hard to pray. Why is it that it's easier for you to go and do what pleases the flesh? That doesn't promise anything on the other side of it. But whenever God promises you everything, we give him every excuse as to why we shouldn't spend time with him. We're better at giving the airlines our luggage than we are giving God. We'll sit here and, 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 and here's the thing. My mom's been on enough missions trips that she's gotten to where she's going and her baggage did not make it to where she's going. So it is not a guarantee. But when the Lord is guaranteeing, would you just give me your baggage and I'll do with it whatever I need to do with it. I'll take the pain away. I'll take the guilt away. I'll take the shame away. I'll take the rejection away. And I'm going to replace it with my love. I'm going to replace it with confidence. I'm going to replace it with a sense of identity. I'm going to replace it and remind you that you are my son, that you are my daughter, that you're not just another person, but you are who I have called. You're who I love. You're who I sent my one and only son for. But the thing is, is we constantly argue with the Lord about it. Jesus understands. He's saying, just stay near to me. You see, through all of this is where I believe that the church got it wrong. See, it's never been about religion. It's only ever been about relationship. He understands your pain. He knew that it would hurt so much so. You realize that Jesus didn't have to experience it at all? but that it could have been as simple as saying, he's this great big God, he's this powerful God. He didn't have to go to the cross. If you really sit there and think about it, so my question is, is why did he send his one and only son? And the reality of it is, is it's not because he had to, but it's because he, the, the number one thing that I can't stand when someone tells me this, whenever I'm going through something, is, hey, I understand what you're going through. I, that, you guys, y'all watch football in here? Y'all know that, that coach, or the guy that has to hold back the coach from rushing the sideline and everything? I'm looking for that holdback guy. I'm sitting there wondering, how in the world are you going to tell me that you understand what I'm going through? Because the reality of it is, is it's until that you've been in my shoes, well, I, I know what you've been through because we've been through something similar. Just because you've been through something similar doesn't mean that it affected you the same way that it affected me. So I'm sitting here, and, and I'm like, why did you send your one and only son? And it wasn't for anything else other than the reason he experienced it for you because one day he knew that you were going to go through it too. And because he experienced it, now he's got authority in it. Can I tell you that whenever you get to the other side, you get your healing, you then have authority in the thing that you are struggling with, and the God is going to release you to break some of those things off of your friends, off of your family. Can I tell you that just because you struggled with it does not mean that your kids have to struggle with it? That you have the authority to break off generational iniquities. Because it's, it, this is bigger than just us. This is bigger for the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, because this is all about legacy. He see, he experienced it for me and for you because he's got a plan. And can I tell you something that you are the plan. You are plan A and you have always been plan A. So we've got to stay close to God. And in my time of prayer with the Lord, I felt the Lord say, I get joy from our conversations. And I feel like the fathering part of God enjoys solving the issues with us. And what I love through this whole story of Jesus going to the cross was even in the middle of doubt, he was still obedient. 
do you realize that at any point, had he not been obedient, had he not followed through with the process, with the plan, then we don't get that mercy and we don't get that grace. And there's going to be times in the middle of your process that it is going to be hard to be obedient to what God has asked you. The reality of it is, is that if you would just be obedient, it's going to be greater than you could ever dream. God is not in the business of giving you what you deserve. He's in the business of giving you everything he has desired for you. See, what you have to come to realize is that the enemy is the father of all lies, and he will do whatever it takes to cause some level of confusion. We see it happen first all the way back in the beginning. Genesis 3, 1 through 6 says that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked this woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, of course we may, eat, uh, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said that you must not eat it or even touch it, and if you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was convinced. Let me ask you this morning, how many of you are battling for a promise right now, and on the other side of it, the enemy's whispering, did God really say? Did God really say? Did God really say? that you're good enough? Did God really say that you're going to see this promise? Did God really say that your kids were going to come home? Did God really say that your marriage was going to be better? Did God really say, did God really say all of these things? And the reality of it is, is every single one of us in here at some point have asked that question. Did God really say? See, the Bible doesn't say that being doubtful is a sin. But it is a sin to be disobedient to what God is asking you to do. You realize that at any point, again, had Jesus been disobedient in the middle of anxiety, saying, Lord, if there's any other way, do you know that the grace and mercy we have now would no longer be existent? You have to understand that the prophetic is not a guaranteed promise to just happen. It's a guaranteed promise on the other side of your obedience. There's a lot of people that I know who have prophetic words who will never see them come to fruition because they weren't obedient to what God had asked them to do. Sometimes you're going to have to take a step of faith and know that Jesus is going to catch you on the other side. Sometimes you're going to have to put some pen to paper and write out the vision. Sometimes you are going to have to put some financial resource behind it. Can I tell you that God, if God is calling you to it, he will support it. I used to sit here and I used to pray or, or, or speak all the time that if God spoke it, you will see it. Not true. Because without your obedience, it will never come to fruition in your life. The other side to this is do you actually know the difference between the enemy's voice and God's voice? Do I have any sneakerheads in here? Any sneakerheads at all? Ooh, let me get you guys started on something, y'all. Okay, so if you come to TWC, my dad, right now, uh, I typically wear Jordan ones, but I got the Robin Hood ones on right now, or the Peter Pan twos, whatever you call them. But if you come to TWC, my dad's always wearing, like, his Jordans and everything, and my dad's, like, full on, like, this morning, He's like, do I match? Do I look like this? Do I look like that? What shoes should I wear? How do I do this? And, and, and I'm just, bro, just pick a pair of shoes. But I get it. I'm going to be real. I get it. But the thing is, is so there's these pair of shoes, and I wish that I would have got the picture of it to show you guys. Uh, but there's this pair of shoes called the Chunky Dunkies. Sounds horrible, right? And they are the ugliest shoe I have ever seen. But I want them so bad. They are so ugly, but I want them. And so what happened was Nike actually did a collaboration with Ben and Jerry's, and so it looks like an ice cream shoe. They got the, some cowhide on the sides, and then it's colorful. Uh, and the shoe originally started out, if you got it at retail, they were going for $100. Nowadays, every sneakerhead wants the Chunky Dunkies because not only does it look like that, but it comes in an ice cream pail. Uh, but... 
they're now going for about twelve to thirteen hundred dollars. That's insane. I am never paying that much money. But I've had some people say, well, well, Hunter, I found them. I found them for like 120 or I found them for 115. And I'm like, hold up, bro. Like, you're going to be buying a fake. Well, how do you know that it's a fake? Well, here's the thing. I took time to study. I took time to actually evaluate what makes this sneaker real from a fake. What, what's the differences that I need to look for so that I'm not getting something fake? Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you spent enough time with God that you know the difference between his voice and the enemy's voice? When was the last time that you actually could evaluate and know the differences? Because here's the thing, the enemy cannot create, he can only replicate. And he'll tell you just enough that sounds good. We see it right here with Eve. He'll say just enough that sounds good and looks good. But just because it sounds good and looks good does not mean that it's good for you. So you have to know the differences. You have to spend time with God to know his voice, to know that if he's called you to it, he will see you through it. But it comes with knowing the difference. And again, you have to get to a place of realizing that this is much bigger than just me. When you think of walking into your promise and walking out your promise, it was never promised to us that it was going to be easy. Jesus, especially, at this time I'm going to go ahead and call the worship team up. But Jesus especially, it wasn't easy for Jesus. Jesus says, like, you would think that he has the A team, but the reality of it is he got the C team. He's got one dude that's going to go around cutting off people's ears. He's got another dude that's going to go around to betray him. He's got a tax collector. He's got the most raggedy A team or C team in the entire world world and I guarantee you it wasn't easy for Jesus but here's the thing that I love about what Jesus did was he didn't call them when they were perfect he called them when they were in their low spot he called them in the middle of their mess and he walked it out with them can I tell you that Jesus will do that for you today that he's going to call you in the middle of your mess to walk it out with you that you don't have to be this way that it doesn't always have to be this way that it doesn't always have to be painful that it doesn't always have to not make sense You see, he did all of these things. He picked these 12, knowing that the reward was not just worth, that the reward was worth not just the risk of a hope, but it was worth his life. So HFA, let me ask you this question. What is your promise worth to you? What's the thing that the Lord has called you to? What's the promise? What's the business? What's the relationship? What's, what has the Lord spoke into your life? What is your promise worth to you? Judas traded Jesus in for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. That's mind-blowing. You know what I can do with 30 quarters? I can go over to Rosa's and go put it in the gumball machine and hope that I get the yellow gumball to get me a bean and cheese burrito. Sounds good, right? You sit here and think that Judas has gotten to walk around with Jesus seeing deaf ears pop open, blind eyes open, dead people get up again. You, and here's the thing, John tells us that not even all the books in the world could record what Jesus did because there was too much. So there's so much more that we don't know. And it's like, Judas, you you got to see this. You got to, to walk around with Jesus. You actually got to know the real him. And then 30 pieces of silver? Are, are, are you serious right now? All for what? What are you gonna do with that 30 pieces of silver? You had a man that was promising you eternity, that was promising you paradise. And you just threw it away. What is your 30 pieces of silver? What is it that every time that we come to church and we have an altar call and the pastor says, hey, if you're dealing with this, this, and this, would you raise your hand? And some of us raise our hand and some of us don't. But even for the ones who who raise their hand, we'll say, will you come and take a step? Where every week at TWC in Lubbock, we give an altar call. 
and we give people an opportunity to step forward to come and get prayed for. And the reality of it is, is it's not to embarrass you or to shame you. It's to give you an opportunity to take a prophetic step away from the past and to take a step into your future. That you are getting up saying, I'm done with my past. I'm done with the hurt. I'm done with the pain. I'm done with the rejection. I'm tired of running and I'm ready to step into what God has for me. But again, what is your 30 pieces of silver that keeps you from doing that? Men, I'm going to challenge you. You may not like this. But we've got to put away the tough guy act. We've got to throw away the tough guy act. Let me ask, is your family not worth you getting your healing? Is your marriage not worth you getting your healing? Is your kids not worth you getting your healing? What keeps you in these chairs every week? Here's the thing, it's not about getting 5 million people up here because even if it's for one person, it's completely worth it. But the thing is, is I'm tired of watching all of my friends come into the church hurt and they leave the church hurt. And it's like, because we, we've built up this idea that I can't come to church and I can't be real. And the reality of it is, is it's not that you can't be real. It's just that we've made this relationship with God too religious. You know what's crazy? There's this statistic that I think it's between 85 and 90% that if the man in the family would give their life to the Lord, that 90% of the time the family will follow. I want you to look around and look at all of these empty chairs. Each of these empty chairs represent one person out there who's hurting. One person who needs to hear the good news of Jesus. What is your 30 pieces of silver? Is it your pride? Is it your stubbornness? Is it, well, I don't know what they're gonna say about me. Here's the reality. It doesn't matter what people say about you because until they get up on the cross and die for your sins, it for sure doesn't matter. Is it, well, I, I have, I gotta get to lunch. Lunch is still going to be there. Let me, let me tell you, especially in Lubbock, that, that's one of the biggest foodie towns I've ever seen. Lunch is going to be there. During football season, the, the, the Dallas Cowboys are going to be there. Record the game. But one day the Dallas Cowboys, that's not who's going to get you saved. What is your promise worth to you. For me, my promise is worth everything. My promise is worth everything because it's, it's much bigger than just me. My promise goes generations deep, legacies deep. My promise keeps me in line whenever I'm out of line. Keeps me humble. You say, well, that's horrible. I don't want that. Without that, I'm not on this stage right now. What is it worth to you? What is your healing worth to you? So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I don't know if you guys do this every week, but we're, we're going to do it today. Maybe you're in here and you say, Pastor Hunter, I, I've been struggling. My whole idea of being in relationship with the Lord, I, I, I'm not going to lie. Maybe I, I, I've made it a little bit religious. I've been struggling. I, 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 I struggle with getting up and looking in the mirror and falling in love with the person that I see. I struggle and I feel like all the time that I just have to do this, this, and this right. But I want to know today that when I leave here, I want to be in relationship with the Lord. True relationship, not relationship that has expectation, but just relationship where I just know that he loves me and things are going to be okay. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, yeah. Once you raise them, you can put them down. Don't miss out on this. Don't let the people sitting beside you cause you to, to wonder to worry. Ask the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're in here and you would say, Pastor, I've been struggling. 
the pain hurts, everything's falling apart. It feels like everything that I touch just falls apart. I go over here and this doesn't make sense. My job, I'm fixing to lose my job. My, my kids, I'm fixing to lose that. I'm fixing to lose this, I'm fixing to lose that. And it just hurts. And I don't care if it's small or if it's big because if it's pain, then the Lord sees it. So stop giving yourself an excuse. Well, my deal, it's not that big of an issue. If it means something to you, then it means something to the Lord. You would sit here and you would say, I need a move of God in my life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I don't care if it's small or big. Yep, 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 got you, got you, got you. Don't miss out on this. Don't let pride keep you where you're at. Only wait five more seconds. Don't miss out. Five, four, yep, got you, yep, got you. Three, yep, got you. Two, Yep, got you. One. Maybe you're in here, you've never given your life to the Lord or you have, but it's kind of been inconsistent. You're not even sure what a relationship with the Lord looks like. Can I tell you, you're just coming into relationship with the best friend. Someone who's gonna have your back no matter what. If that's you, never given your life to the Lord or, or you wanna recommit because you've kind of been teeter-tottering. If that's you, regardless if it's first time, or if this is a second, third, fourth, whatever it is, if that's you, would you just raise your hand? Come on, yeah, yeah, come on, yep, got you, yeah, I got you, come on. Now here's the thing, I don't know if you guys do altar workers or anything like that, but the thing is, is I think altar workers are great, but the reality of it is, is we didn't come here to just meet with another person. We came here to meet with the great I am. So I wanna challenge you again. What is your 30 pieces of silver? If it is something physical that you have on you, come up here, throw it up on the stage. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's drugs. I don't care if it's blade. I don't care if it's, if it's tobacco. I don't, what is it, cigarettes? What is it? What is holding you back from being in true relationship with the Lord? It's time to lay it down. So if you raised your hand for any of those things, would you just take that next step and come up to the altar real quick? And I just wanna pray with you. Don't, don't wait on anyone else. This is something normal we do at my church all the time. They're already coming, you won't be alone. Do not miss out. Stop giving yourself an opportunity to come into the church and just to leave all the time. This is between you and the Lord. There was more that raised their hand. Stop giving yourself an excuse. I'm gonna challenge you today. Yeah, 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 come on. There was still more that raised their hand. Stop letting pride be a reason. Stop letting shame, stop letting guilt. Keep on coming, keep on coming, keep on coming. Cause I know not everyone in here is, going, is being perfect right now. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in his life. God, that you would bring freedom, that you would bring healing like never before, that you would show up, that you would show out, you would do what you do best, that you would remind him that he is a son, that the pain of the past no longer has to be there, that the chains that held him back, God, I ask that you would free him right now in the name of Jesus, that every ounce of rejection would leave him in the name of Jesus, that the self-hatred would go right now in the name of Jesus, and rather that it would be replaced with complete joy. With those that are sitting, would you guys just go ahead and stand with us and join us in worship and pray for these up here that you would, the way that you'd want someone to pray over you. You're more than enough. You're 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 more than enough. You're not broken. You're not too broken. You're not too broken. In the name of Jesus. Let it burn, 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 let it burn. He looks like a hurricane. I am. Let it out, let it out. You're good, you're good. And deep beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. Emma, can I get your help? And all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions. i
We thank you for the service today. We thank you for being a good and gracious God. We thank you for showing up time and time again. God, that you would continue to do what you do best, Lord, that you would bless each and every single person in here, that as they go on through the rest of their day, through the rest of their life, that they don't have to look back wondering if there was a God that loved them because you're already here. You chose them for such a time as this. So, Lord, I release over this campus, over this church, God, that there would be expansion, that there would be growth, that there would be more, that others would come to see this place as a house of restoration, as a house of peace, as a house of growth. Lord, that you would guide, that you would direct each and every single person 
person to know that they play a part in this church, not just Pastors Cameron and Sarah, but each and every single person in here. Lord, we pray for Pastor Cameron and Sarah, God, that you would give them peace, that you would give them rest, Lord, that you would download new visions, new plans, new blueprints, because there is more to come. If you think, let me tell you, HFA, if you think that this is the only campus, there's more campuses to come. So hold on, because God is going to do something really special in this house, and I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a blessing to be a part of it. Lord, we thank you for it, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, the whole church said, amen. Thank you guys so, so much. Thank you guys for joining us for this week's service. If you asked Jesus to come into your heart or you rededicated your life, we want to know about it. So stay connected with us on our website. You'll see it below the screen. You'll go to connect. You'll go to prayer request, whatever it is that you need. We want to stay connected with you. Fill out the connect card with all your information. We promise not to blow up your, your email with a junk mail or anything like that or call you or send you out mass text. We just want to know your information in case you need us. Um, we are here for you. So we can't wait to see you guys next week. Please join us.